I'm happy to help you all with any questions that uh, you may have. Perfect. Thank you so much for all of that information. We definitely have a couple of questions. Um, so I am going to find the first one here. Can you talk a little bit about um, age groups? Would this work with young adults? Does it work with younger children? What have you noticed? It, we start treating at about three and a half to four. Nicole, we started treating children about four years old, three and a half. Um, so far, we started treating about three and a half. My oldest patient was 103 years old, mm -hmm. not not with autism. It was my dad. <laughs> my dad uh, when he was 103. Uh, we have patients that we treat. We have a lot. And 20 percent of our patients are adults. It works at any age. We may start treating younger, but right now we don't start treating until about three and a half to four. Perfect. Um, another question about how many sessions of neurofeedback do most patients need and how is that determined? Well, it's determined by the, the severity of the symptoms and the brain mapping. Uh, for ADHD, you need a minimum of 34 treatments. If you're on a lot of medications, you're going to need more than 34 if you want to be able to have a chance of reducing significantly the medications. Autism, you need a minimum of 40 of 42 treatments. We have, uh, if you're nonverbal, you're probably going to need more than 42. I had one patient on the autism spectrum, probably the most remarkable patient ever treated. He had over 150 treatments. When the parents brought their child to us, he was on eight different medications, dosages that were that were inappropriate to put a child on, and. The medicating physician was now trying to get him institutionalized. They were desperate. They brought him to us and I was able to titrate him off every single medication that took more than 150 treatments. That's unusual, but that was a pretty inspirational case. Uh, most people just, you need a minimum of 42. It may go more, it just depends on the severity and what shows up on the brain mapping. Perfect. Um, this is also a great question. Are you able to do neurofeedback with a child that is sensory defensive to anything on his head? And can you get around this issue? That's a great question. The first, if they're sensory sensitive, the first thing we do is we'll do a practice, we'll loan the parents a practice electrode where they can, it's like an ear clip on the ear and you put it on your ear, let your child see it on your ear and then put it on his ear. We want the child to get comfortable with that for a few days and they come in the clinic for a trial treatment. And I'd say maybe half of children doing the trial treatment will do fine and we know we can accept them into the treatment program. If they don't do well, uh, we'll repeat the trial treatment again. And we'll do up to four trial treatments. As long as they keep improving every time, we'll keep it. There was one child, I think we did about nine trial treatments before we accepted the child in the treatment. That was unusual. But the child kept improving every time, but not enough where we felt comfortable that we could treat him. By nine treatments, the symptoms already were improved before even starting the program. Uh, but usually we'll go up to four trial treatments. Uh, it's not uncommon, you know, uh, it's common for kids on the spectrum to have sensory processing uh, disorder. We see it all the time. But they get more comfortable every time we do a treatment, every time we do a trial treatment. Now, we may not get a brain mapping of the child for five to 10 treatments if they really have a hard time, but that's okay because we have a generic protocol. We start every child off with on the spectrum and usually by five to 10 treatments, they're comfortable getting a brain map done. Perfect. And then we have a couple questions like this. Did, um, do you need like booster sessions after you determine how many sessions they would need or like, is it permanent or do you have to keep going back to, to get neurofeedback? Well, I've learned in medicine and psychology. I also have a master's degree in psychology before I went to medical school. I never used the word permanent, but I can tell you that uh, most patients that we treat do not have to come back for treatment. Now, we, we're now following patients for 12 months after discharge. It, it's really infrequent they have to come back. If we do everything the first time that they, that they need improved, uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, booster sessions were more common, but with the advancements of the technology and now with S. W. Loretta neurofeedback, it, it's uncommon someone has to come back. I can only speak for our clinic. I can't speak for, uh, for other, other providers. Perfect. 
Um, my son has frequent staring spells and motor and vocal tics. Is neurofeedback something that would help issues like that? You said uh, staring spells? Yeah, staring spells and motor and vocal tics. Motor and vocal tics, the answer is yes. Staring spells, first of all, he should have a, a, a diagnostic EEG with a neurologist to be sure he's not having seizures and not having seizure activity. Uh, over half of kids on the autism spectrum are gonna have abnormal EEGs. They, can, they have abnormal epileptiform activity, not necessarily a seizure, but abnormal epileptiform activity. It's very common on the spectrum. Even if the child has seizures, we can also help that with neurofeedback. In fact, neurofeedback, before it was ever used for ADHD or autism, it was used for treating intractable seizures that even anti-convulsant medication couldn't, could not stop. It was first used to help seizures. So yes, the child is treatable, but they should get a workup to rule out a seizure disorder first. They may need to be on medication too. Perfect, and another great question. Are there any specific credentials um, slash specific training to look for in providers doing neurofeedback? So pretty much how to find a good provider. Uh, well, you want to be sure that they're a licensed professional in the state that you live in. They need to be licensed, either a licensed physician or licensed psychologist or therapist, MFT therapist. And um, that, would, that, that would be first. And you want to know what their training is. In, in neurofeedback, biofeedback, QEG brain mapping, how long have they been doing it? How many patients have they helped? And just trust your intuition. Perfect. Um, have you seen, is this effective on severe autism? Uh, it's not, when severe, I would have to know how low, fun, the age of the child and how low functioning they are. We have helped severe, low-functioning autistic children. They may only improve 20, 25%. That's all. Whereas a, a, a level one or level two autism child may improve anywhere from 30 to 99%. Uh, level three, severe level three may only improve 20, 25%. But to that child and to the parents, it's life-changing. Perfect. Do you recommend any testing to be done prior to starting? It's not necessary. We do our own evaluations, but we may, uh, we may refer for uh, additional testing sometimes, or I may refer to a neurologist to get a, a diagnostic EEG to rule out, rule out epilepsy or seizure disorder. Um, we, we do refer out sometimes. Perfect. And then a couple questions on, does insurance typically cover this, cover this or is it out of pocket? Unfortunately, no, they typically do not. And we bill it as neurofeedback for autism. We work with patients financially. I mean, we do everything we can do within our own, own limitations to work with families financially. We have medical finance programs for families. Um, we're able to work it out with most people that need to come to see us, but it is out of pocket, but it is a, because we're a medical clinic. It is a tax deductible medical expense. Perfect. Um, and then can, this is, I think the last question, but do you have to be able to sit for long periods of time to be able to do neurofeedback? Well, the maximum treatment session is 30 minutes with younger autistic children that are more developmentally challenged we may only start with 16 minutes 15 minutes sometimes less is more mm -hmm. you know i'll share a story with you eight or nine years ago we had a child come to us he was eight years old had uh, a, a rare a genetic chromosomal disorder he had all the symptoms of autism, ADHD, couldn't read nor write. He was having bowel movements in his pants every day. And after the initial evaluation brain mapping, his mother calls me four days later and she says, Dr. Velkoff, I can't believe it. He's not had an action in his pants since the brain mapping. Could the brain mapping have helped him that much? I said, no, the brain mapping is just a, a diagnostic test. It doesn't do anything. But I said, we did a neurofeedback treatment. 
in the evaluation, an abbreviated treatment in the evaluation, obviously that treatment impacted on him. She, she says, well, you know, Dr. Velikoff, I've been through every treatment in the world for my son. Nothing has made a difference. So I'm skeptical coming to you. Well, I'm not skeptical anymore after what's happened the last four days. We're so excited to start his treatment now. They start treatment. And then two weeks later, she calls me. She says, Dr. Velikoff, he's having bob movements in his pants again. And I thought, that doesn't make sense. He should be getting better and better. So I spoke to the staff and I found out that in the brain map evaluation appointment, we only gave him 15 minutes of neurofeedback uh, because it was just too much. He had a, a half a session. And then I, I realized his brain can't handle 30 minutes. It's too much on his brain. He needs a shorter session. So I called up the mother. I said, look, uh, don't be upset with me, but we're only going to give him 15 minute treatments. That's all. She says, well, he won't get full care. I said, that's not true. When you're dealing with a child who is more developmentally brittle or fragile, you, you've got to, you've got to deliver what their brain can handle. Less is more. Start him off on 15 minutes within a week, no longer having Bob Lynch's panties doing wonderful again. So of course she pressures me to take him up to 30 minutes. I wouldn't do it. I think I took him up to 18 minutes. I never did more than 18 minutes. He improved more than any child in our clinic that year. So Nicole, I've learned less is more if a child is really severe. So it's unusual. Rarely we'll have someone that's really untreatable. It's rare because the treatment is very engaging. My staff are very compassionate and empathetic. They know how to work with kids who are very challenged. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to sneak another question. Um, are there stronger results with younger children? Are the results fairly consistent across age ranges? Have you seen? I would say the I, the optimal window to treat is maybe five to ten or eleven. Um, we get good results at four years old. The mm -hmm. optimal window is five to ten or eleven. But again, the age is not as critical. The family dynamics, family uh, parenting, stress in the child's life are really much more critical in the age of the child. We, we could have an eight-year-old child that has a difficult time uh, because of outside stress, stress factors. We could have a 15-year-old, great family dynamics, proactive parents, wonderful environment. Kid does great. Age is not the most important factor, but if everything else is even, five to 11 is probably the, the easiest age to treat. But, you know, the youngest child I treated that was nonverbal, uh, the first time was four years and two months old, and I discharged her when she recited the Lord's Prayer. It took 75 treatments, but um, when she recited the Lord's Prayer, she didn't need us anymore. Yeah. So the, the, the age, it's a secondary factor, but it is more challenging. And they, and they may need, if it's a four-year-old, they may need more than 42 treatments. Perfect. All right. Well, that wraps up all of the questions. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us live today. And if you're watching the recording, um, and Dr. Belkoff, thank you so much for all of this information. We haven't had a presentation like this in a while, and we're just so grateful that you're able to share all your knowledge with us. Well, I, I'm very uh, I'm very grateful and thank, thankful to, th to Taka and all of you. My best to everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.